Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining me once again today. I appreciate having your company. Today, I want to talk to you about women, and especially about women who praise the Lord. Um, I thought it was a, a topic that I'd like to um, talk about for some time, and the Lord laid on my heart to, to speak, because women are, are very precious um, for men. That's why God gave uh, Eve to Adam as, as a wife in the very beginning, because they're, they're precious and man needed a help meet, uh, someone to help their needs and someone to work with. And also, it, God did that so that mankind can go forward and they could have children and families and move forward. So there's a very, very important role with women. And you know sometimes people play it down, but um, today I'm going to highlight some things and show you why it, it's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And women... Um, have, have a great role to play in Christianity, in the church, and in the lives of men, and should always be respected for that. Now, when we go back to the beginning, we, we spoke about Adam and Eve and, and how God saw that he was lonely and he needed somebody. Nothing's changed today. Men need to have a woman because that makes them complete. They need, they need that comfort. They need the, the things that men don't think of are the things that women think of it's just the way it is and you know it, it, it can never replace that because you know, my, my wife you know she thinks of things I don't think of and I think of things that she doesn't think of but when we see today we see that the churches have predominantly more women than men how about that there are more women who are praising God in our churches today than there are men um, I probably put some of that down to, you know, this muncho thing or I don't need anybody type thing that us men often have and I have myself for a long time. We have that role. And maybe that's why there are more women in the church. Maybe women are more sensitive to the love of God. Maybe that's why there are more women in the church than there are men. I'm not really sure of the reason, but Statistics, and I know statistics may not always be accurate, but statistics tell us today that more women are in the church, more women are praising God, more women are serving in the church than men are. So that, that's a blessing within itself if you stop and you think about that. Now, you know, there are people who say, oh, well, you know, the women are, are, are not thought about in the Bible, they're not thought about in the church, they're always placed second. Well, none of that's quite true either. You know, I, I'm going to tell you honestly that a, a church would not operate properly without the women, okay? Mind you, they're not necessarily the leader, and that doesn't necessarily equate to everything, because quite often a leader can't be a leader without the people under him. And if you look at a pastor of a church or a minister of a church, okay, you would find that the woman or the women in the church, his wife and the women in the church, are the ones who do all the hard work. Sure, he's a leader. Sure, he preaches the word of God. That's what he's called to do. But the women are the ones who are doing just about everything else. How could a church possibly survive without the women? It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. I have never, ever, ever been in or seen a church where the women are not basically the keepers of the church. Not necessarily the leaders, like I said, but the keepers of the church. The ones who just about do everything else in the church other than leadership. Now, that was God's way. That's what, that's what God planned. And when we look at the Bible, we see that, I believe, from a rough count, there's about 86 women in the Bible that um, have attributed, in the Bible, who, who have spoken words, over 10,000 words in the Bible, from women, okay? Now, some of those women are, have got a name, and some of those women don't have a name. And it's exactly the same for men. Some of the men in the Bible have a name, and some of the men in the Bible don't have a name. Now, God obviously has a reason for that, and I don't know what it is. But where a name is needed, God has put it in there, okay? That's why we have the lineage from Adam to David, from David to Christ. We have a lineage, okay? Those names are important. There's a reason why God didn't put all the names in and all the lineages in because there, there, there'd be thousands of volumes of this book, folks. This one's big now. Look at this. I mean, there'd be thousands of these. Like John said in, in the, at the end of John, the, 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 book, the world couldn't contain the books if you started listing all the lineage and all the names. And Christ, when he spoke in parables, he didn't use names. When he spoke about true things, he sp and, you know, rather than parables, I'm not saying the parables aren't true, but they're just without a name. When he spoke of other things, they had names, but parables didn't have a name. 
They were for teaching. Now, whether they were true situations or life situations that had happened before, we're not privy to know, but they were there without a name. It doesn't mean that there's no respect there, you know. L let, me, let me give you an example. You know, um, I, I go to a coffee shop where, where I, I love going to, to a coffee shop and I know the name of the lady and the man who, who made my coffee and, and I know that. But sometimes when I'm out and about, I go and get a coffee made by somebody and unless they've got a name badge on, if they've got a name badge on, I call them by name. Man, all of them. But if, if otherwise, if they're busy making coffee, I don't ask them for their name. I don't do that. And especially in today's age, if you went to a coffee shop and started asking the, the woman barista who's making your 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 your, uh, your drink her name, she you know she might think you're a bit creepy or something. I don't know. It's the world we're living in. You know, I love to talk to people, but you got to be careful. Sometimes they get the wrong idea. So. Not knowing the name, look, you know, I'm a person who loves names. I, I, I love to know who, I, or who I'm dealing with. And they've got a name on, I call them by name and quite often tell them my name. But there would be reasons, reasons that you should understand and not just assume why God hasn't given people a name in the Bible. Like I said, there'd be volumes and volumes and volumes. And today I'm going to look at women who, who praise God in the Bible. But I'm going to do something different. I'm actually going to go forward and I'm going to look at women today who praise God, okay? Women who have a profile, women who are, I guess, you know, out there being seen, who actually say, I stand on the Word of God. Because, let me tell you, you know, women have been fighting for equality for many years and respect for many years and all these kind of things. Yet, I see women putting down women because they love God. Isn't that a crime? Isn't that a shame? Didn't you want equality? Didn't you fight for equality? We've been banging, you know, these women banging on the doors and feminism for, for, I don't know, most of my lifetime. Banging for this and banging for that. Okay, maybe sometimes there was a, a, a just cause in there. Maybe. But hang on a minute. You've got, you've got some of those things now. Maybe you still want some more. Maybe, you, you know, I don't know. But how come you put down women who are praising God? You women who bang on... The table for equal rights. It's not equal rights for a woman to love God as well. Hello, wake up. Look, I'll go through that today because there are some uh, marvellous women in our day and age who have a very high profile, who do love and praise the Lord, just like some of those women of old. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for giving Adam a helpmeet. We thank you for the the women that serve today in our churches. We thank you for the women that still stand up and say, God is love, God is truth, God is mercy, God is grace. They're still in the walls of the church, they're still serving and they're still loving, Lord. I pray, Father, today you give them grace, you give them mercy, you give them protection, give them and their family protections, Lord. Help them to stay strong for the love of God. Help them to stay strong for Christ. Father, I pray that you would take away all the peril and all the people who would uh, want to give them grief. Give them peace and safety, please, Lord. I pray, Father, that those who are outside of the church, who don't understand, would listen and learn from the wonderful oracles of God, the Divine Library today, Father, as we open it and we praise your wonderful and holy name. Do We do ask and pray all these things in the wonderful name of Christ, who is our Saviour. Amen. Now, we live in a world that's um, quick to condemn people, um, and it's always a problem I've had um, with many forms of Christianity, is we have to love people, and we have to show them the love of God. Uh, condemnation hardens the heart. And uh, whilst we don't want to water down sin or, or things like that, that's, that's not what we're about, but we've got to have a balance. We're all about sin, well then we've lost the, we've lost the plot. We're all about love, we've lost the plot got to have an application in there and we've got to love people, we've got to try to understand people. I'm starting out today um, in the book of Joshua about a story uh, the Bible refers to this woman as, as, as a harlot, as, as a prostitute. Now I want to say from, from the outset that quite often uh, w women who are in that service are looked down and frowned upon and I think that's wrong. I don't think you're ever going to help a woman by looking down and frowning upon her for what she does. Okay, um, 
You've got to love them, you've got to try to help them and, and understand. So let's read in chapter 2 of Joshua and um, we'll start in verse 1. It says here, And the Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out to Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go and view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into a harlot's house named Rehab, and lodged there. Now, this sounds very odd, doesn't it? But God had sent them there. So I said to you, you know, they judge people in, in harsh ways. Why? Well, let's read on and find out. And as it was told, the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither to the night of children of Israel to search out the country. So these men were basically spies. <laughs> but they were God's spies, okay? They were looking for a purpose here. There was a reason for it, okay? Let's read on. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. So, these men entered into the house. Obviously, somebody had seen them enter into the house and said, hey, listen, these, these, these men are, are, are of Jewish descent. Um, obviously, you could probably tell by the way they were dressed. And they've gone into her house. And the king wanted to know why. He knew that was spies. Verse 4, And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said, Thus there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. She said, I don't know that, but she hid them. Why? Why would she hide these men? It's because she knew who they were. Read on. And it came to pass about the time of shutting the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I would not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she brought them up to the roof of the house. So basically, they'd set up a plan to trap these men. But look what happens. Okay, here we go. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. So she had laid the... They're like leaves type thing twigs, leaves, whatever you want to call them, the flax, on the rooftop, but she'd hid them underneath these things so that they couldn't be seen. Verse 7, And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which were pursued after them, they were gone out, they shut the gate. Okay? So, read on. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and said unto them, I know that the Lord have given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. She knew God. She knew what was going on. She understood. Read on. It says this in verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the kings of the Amorites and on the other side of Jordan, Shion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is a God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Therefore, verse 12, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token. Verse 13. She's asking for mercy. She said, your God is, is, is great. I'm asking for mercy. God gives it. And that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours, if you utter not this our business, and it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, 
we will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line for a scarlet thread in the window which thou dost let us down by. Thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, and thy brethren, and thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whatsoever shall go out of the doors of thine house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and will be guiltless. And whatsoever shall be with thee in thine house, his blood shall be on our head, and if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, when we quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. Basically what's happened here is, she hid the spies, she told them that she trusted God. Now you, I guess some people might say, but hang on a minute, she was in sin, she was a harlot, she was a prostitute. You're just, you're just telling me that a, a prostitute can't love God? I'm telling you that anybody can love God. I'm telling you this is a God of equality. I'm telling you this is a God who loves everybody. God doesn't love the sin, but God loves the people. The Bible says that he gave his only begotten son, willing that none should perish. People, I want to tell you that it was once said by a very famous preacher when someone came to him and said, what do you think about divorce? He said, God hates divorce, but God loves the divorcee, the person, the person, the people. We've got to look at the people. We've got to look beyond what they do. People, look at the people. You must love and understand people. And women being the softer, the more gentle ones, they need more love. They need more understanding. You want to help them out. Love them and understand them. This is what happened here. And look at the compassion of the woman. Would you save my father? Would you save my mother? Would you save my brethren? It's possible they even knew what she was doing. And they were in such grief knowing what she was doing. But she had the compassion to want them all to be saved. And she had the compassion to hide the men. She had the compassion to say, your God is the greatest God. Wow. It's really important that the love of people is above, above what they do. We also have a, a, a similar kind of story where uh, Christ was with a woman who was in adultery. And she'd been caught in adultery and they brought her before Christ and they all wanted to stone her. And Christ said, well, they're okay. But first of all, anyone who's without sin in this group that want to stone her, if you're without sin, you cast the first stone. One win, two win, three win, four win, they'll win. It's just a woman in Christ's land. And he said to her, where are your accusers? Where are they now? They're all gone. He showed great love, great compassion for the woman. He said to her, go. And then he said, no more. Clean it up. Fix things up. That's basically the, the whole thing, folks. It's about getting people back on track. It's about loving people, not condemning them. It's about showing them a better way, a better life, more grace, more mercy, more love, more trust in God. And today, like I said, there's more women in the church than there are men, which is, you know, unbelievable, really. I mean, there really should be more men in the church, shouldn't there? Big, strong guys, you know, but they all think they're too tough for that. But look, there are so many more stories. Um, I've got another story that I'm going to read you now from the, the Old Testament, and then we're going to read a couple from the New Testament. And then I'm going to do something I wouldn't normally do, but I'm going to look at women today who proclaim and profess the love of God. Let's look at some more verses. Okay, turn with me now to the book of Esther, and uh, we'll read here Esther chapter 7. It says here, And the king again said unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to half of the kingdom. He was prepared to give the queen a lot. Then Esther, the queen, answered and said, 
If I have found favour in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Very brave woman. Verse 4. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Verse 5. Then the king, Asahiris, answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he? And where is he that does presume in his heart to do so? He wanted to know who wanted to destroy the Jewish people. And Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is the wicked Hanan. Then Hanan was afraid before the king and the queen. What the story is here, folks, is you, you have a king who has previously um, uh, not been treating women very well um, if they didn't obey him. Anyway, Queen Esther was, was of course afraid. So she knew that there was one of his aides who wanted to destroy the Jewish people. He wanted to have them slain. So she went before the king on this special time, which was a time of celebration. And she said, King, there's a man who wants to destroy my people. Can you please save us? Now, she was at risk and she said so in the verses there of, of having her head cut off, of being hung, of, of, of being killed. If the king thought she was causing trouble, but she said, there's somebody doing it. And she told him who it was. And because of Queen Esther, and because her love for God, and because of her love for the people of Israel, the Jewish people, they were saved. They were spared. Wow. Marvellous. Incredible. Incredibly brave. That a woman could do that. But women can be brave. Women can be strong. We read of women's role in wars. Not necessarily always to pick up guns and fight, but often to mend the men, feed the men, give the men clothing. Like I said, they may not be out there being the soldiers, but the soldiers wouldn't be out there without the women. I'm telling you, the doors of the churches wouldn't be open if it wasn't for women. Don't underestimate the value of women. Goodness gracious me. I've never seen a man who is successful in the ministry who doesn't have a woman behind him who's working just as much as him as if not more. It's very, very important that honour is given where honour is due. And now I want to look at some women in the New Testament and we'll, we'll look at some of those very briefly and then we'll conclude today by looking at women who are alive today who stand up and say, I love God. Because, praise the Lord, there are still some of those. Okay, let's look at some verses in the New Testament. I guess the uh, greatest place to start in the New uh, Testament would be in Luke. So let's go to Luke chapter 1 and uh, we'll go and start in verse 26. Here we go, it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. I don't think there could ever be a, a greater privilege afforded to a woman than to be the earthly bearer of the Son of God. Um, that's the greatest privilege you could ever have. It was given to a woman. Verse 28, And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed art thou among women. Okay, you're blessed among the women. Okay. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, 
and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what happened. That's what happened with Mary. Now, I, I, I just can't imagine the amount of, of, of grace and mercy and love that this woman had for God in order for him to choose her. Obviously, a blessed woman. She'd found favour. She loved God. She trusted God. And God knew she was humble enough, graceful enough to be able to do this job. God knew the inner heart of this woman. He said, this is the woman. This is a woman I've chosen. The story, of course, is Christmas, as we know, and what happened with the birth and all the things. And but then we, we, we sort of we miss the part where things move on, and, and Christ's ministry starts at the age of twelve and goes on to the age of thirty-three. And we, we we read lots of different things about different women in in that point of time, and we read about Mary Magdalene. And there's also many many women who who who, who are at the cross when Christ was beaten and suffered and died and bled for all humanity. There were women there. Not, and again, not every woman was given a name. No. No. Were there more women than men? We don't know. We know that it was women who went to the tomb. We know that. Again, there's that soft and gentle heart that knew and then there were multitudes who saw Christ when he rose. Women and men. We don't read the names, not necessarily, no. We know he was seen of the disciples. We know that he was, he was seen of, of multitudes. We know, we know he did miracles throughout his life. He healed people, you know. We know the woman at the well. He told her her life. He, 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 and there were miracles everywhere. He healed the blind, the sick. Made the deaf to hear, made the blind to see. Men, women, children. We know all these things. And there were women there who were with him and watched him suffer. But then there were women who were there when he rose again and rejoiced. Hmm. Not necessarily given by name, no. But they were there. Were there more women than men? Don't know, but there's more women spoken about than men there at the time. The women were the first ones to go into the tomb to see that Jesus had arisen. The women were the ones who went and told everyone he'd arisen. This is special. This is special. Could you imagine that? He's alive. He said he'd be alive. He's alive. We know that the role of women is super important. We know that the role of women at the, the, the conception of Christ, the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, they were women. All kinds of different women from all different places, from all different uh, walks of life. And God knew every one of them by name. We may not, but that's not important. I don't need to know them by name. I just trust what he says. They were there. The Mary, mother of Joseph, Mary Magdalene, some other women. Yeah. We read of, of, of Martha and, and, and Mary and, and, you know, Washing Jesus' feet. Women again. Two women. <laughs> one making dinner and one washing the feet of Jesus. Both had a job to do. But we, I don't read anywhere where Christ has said you have to do this or something they wanted to do. Because women are the gentle ones. Women are that kind. When they see somebody suffering or somebody hurting or somebody in need, it, it's what happens. It's what the mothers do. But very few children run to their dad. <laughs> if they've fallen over, they tend to run to their mum. That's part of life, isn't it, you know? Next time you go to a park or something and the mum and dad are there and the child falls over, you watch who they run to. It's the mum. Because that's the instinct. They're the gentle one. They're the, they're the one who gives the comfort. They're the one who's, you know, they don't have these big strong hands that the men have and this big, well, oh, get over it, you know, toughen up. They don't have that. They'll bathe them and they'll fix it up and they'll do all those things because that's what they do. That's God said there, that helped me. There's some men who can do that, but it's, it's far and few between. I know over the years when my kids would have a fall and I'd fix it up, they'd go, Dad, we'll go to Mum. <laughs> 
<laughs> Praise God for that. Okay, well, look, I want to now look at some women uh, today um, in, in our current generations who stand up and, and say they love God because, you know, they often get ridiculed for that, but there are some wonderful women who do stand up and say, we love God. And women, you should never ridicule women who stand up and say uh, they love God because you've been banging on about these rights forever. Okay, so um, I've got to do that. Now I'm going to read another verse and then we'll look at some modern day women. I'm going to read now from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 10. It says this, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant ship, she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins about with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceived that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold of the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. Wonderful verses about a woman and some of the respecting some of the work that she does there. Maybe in the old-fashioned sense, but certainly today, women are generally the keepers of the household and doing wonderful things. And now just uh, the key verse from today, of course, is this, Proverbs chapter uh, 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised. A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm going to praise some women who are uh, in our modern generation who love the Lord, who have been strong and have demonstrated great strength. And I'm going to start with one who is our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II. And she has been a wonderful monarch. She has been a strength. And she has been an encouragement. She has always, always, always stood up and trusted God. In every one of her royal speeches, she has always referred to the Lord. She's always referred to his praise, his love, his mercy. And this is a wonderful trademark. And this is why she has been a successful monarch for so many decades now, because she has trusted in the Lord. She has been absolutely uh, amazing in her testimony towards the Lord and her testimony towards loving people. She has always been very strong through wars and through terrorism, through family crisis. She has been a, an absolute uh, monarch who, who is to be praised without any doubt whatsoever. And look, it, it's not easy being a leader um, in, in her position. And by the way, she's also the leader of the church. Okay? She's, she's in... she's. She's the head of the church, but she's not necessarily the one who teaches in the church. And that's the way it is. That's the way the church is set up. And some may not like that, but that's the way it's always been since its conception. That's the way God set it up. Now, she, she is the head of the church, yes, but she does, she's not the one who does all the teaching, no. But people could learn a lot from her because she has been a wonderful monarch throughout the years. Now, I want to talk about some other women today, and um, let's... Just take, a, a, I've got some quick photos to show you here uh, of the women I'm going to talk about. So the first one you're, you're seeing here is Elizabeth Elliot. Now, she uh, was the wife of Jim Elliot, the missionary, uh, who went to the Orca people uh, to try and evangelise them, and he, he got killed by those people. And, look, I, I, I can't find words to describe it because you think that this would make the woman bitter. She'd lost her husband um, and in, in terrible circumstances. But no, it didn't. She actually went back to the tribe to try and help them overcome uh, what had taken place and show them the love of God. And today she's a, a speaker and an author of, of books and things like that. And she's used her time instead of being bitter to be a, a strong woman and give the praise to God. Um, she could have easily gone the other way she could have easily turned around and said, 
um, you, know, oh, you know, this is all too hard, God's taken away my husband or, or the devil's taken my husband or whatever. But in actual fact, she turned what was a, a calamity and a tragedy into something so special today that many, 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 many women and men have come to the Lord through that ministry, including the Orca people who were responsible for, for, for killing her husband and, and some other men who were there as well. So you can see how a, a woman who gives praise to God is, is very, very special and God has rewarded her life um, through that calamity, through that tribulation and today um, it, uh, she can rest assured that uh, you know, she, she's done a wonderful job. Let's look at another one. Of course, uh, Corrie ten Boom, we read of, of Corrie ten Boom, who was um, very, very, very prolific in, in hiding the Jewish people from the Nazis so that they wouldn't be sent to concentration camps and, and death camps and things like that. Trusted God all the time in, in these things. Now, also, let me say to you that there were probably many other men and women at the time who were doing similar things and they might have lost their life doing it and we don't read about them. We don't know their names, but there were people who were helping the Jewish people, um, just a few who, who would risk their lives and do those things. And Corrie ten Boom being, the, I guess, the, the, the most famous of all those people who were helping out the Jewish people during the time of, of Nazi occupation. Um, but again, a woman who trusted God and uh, was able to do miracles uh, by trusting in him and, and save so many people. Let's look at another one. I was very privileged to be um, part of the uh, Olympics and Paralympics that we had here in Sydney as part of the, the media contingent. And uh, I've got to say to you that um, in, in the mainstream Olympics, I didn't uh, come across many people who had a, a, a love for God um, but in the Paralympics, I found, I did find more um, men and, and women who um, were, had a disability, as I call them, rather than disability, a different ability, um, who had uh, trusted God through their tribulation, through their trials and, and things. And you know, look, I had brief conversations with many people. And there are a lot of Christians and people there who profess God and, 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 and things like that. Sadly, we don't see it so much in the mainstream sports. Um, what we see is more condemnation if a person comes out and says they're a Christian uh, today um, rather than, um, you know, anything else. Um, if, if a man or a woman come out and say they're a Christian, uh, they start getting attacked immediately by, you know, all these uh, people and all these corporations and the LGBT, DFDA, JKB. Every, everyone out there wants to say, oh, you're a hate speech, you're a hate speech, you're a hate speech, you know. But women, if you love God, stand up and say you love God. Men, if you love God, stand up and say you love God. Don't, don't let people um, push you around. Uh, just... Say to them, listen, I'm not the judge, you know, go and speak to God if you've got a problem with his writings, you know. I'm not the judge, you know, we're all judged equally, we're all judged by the same book and that's all there is to it, you know. And, and if you don't believe, well, that's fine too. But don't force me to believe what you, what you believe because that's not, not the way it works. I mean, you can't force anybody for Christianity to, because it's bunk, it, it wouldn't work, it, it wouldn't happen. There, there are women in this country who, who are helping um, people who are trying to, uh, athletes who are trying to overcome some of the difficulties we have with biological problems within athletes now where men want to identify as women and women want to identify as men. They're still trying to work through those things because anybody who stands up and says, well, I don't think it's right, I think we should stay with biology, they're instantly, instantly dropped, thrown out, kicked out, not play anymore, lost your livelihood, lost your life people knocking on your door all kinds of the night. It's just horrible, horrible stuff. Just because you want to say that, there's a, 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 a God-fearing woman called Akirali Smith here in Australia who um, has an organisation called Binary who stands up and, and says, listen, you know, enough's enough. We, we, we need to just, you know, women are women, men are men, and, you know, you can identify as anything you want. You identify as a tree, a bird, a boat, whatever you want, doesn't matter. But leave others alone. Don't force them to accept what you want to be because... It's never harmonious to force people to accept things. It, it's ne never, ever, ever going to help anybody. Look back at history. When you force people to do things, the outcome is never, ever, ever one of harmony. It's all the other things against that. 
Um, you should never force people to do things. And hey, listen, you know, we respect every individual, we love every individual, and every individual in the eyes of God is equal. We're all judged by the same thing. It's not your judge more than me or I'm judged more than you. We're all judged the same. So please, you know, if, if you're a woman of faith or even if you're a man of faith, stand up and say I'm a man of faith, but don't don't, don't use condemnation to do it because that's that's when they you know, turn it back on you and go, it's all hate, you know. We've got to do it in the right way, we've got to do it in a respectful way, and we've got to do it in a loving way and show people that we're not about condemnation, we're not about hate speech, we're, we're about wanting to help people the best we possibly can. But if they don't agree with us, that's fine. We're, the world is made up of people who don't agree with each other, but we can still live with each other. We don't have to threaten each other with all kinds of things, we just, you know, people can choose what they want in life, they can choose a certain kind of life and, you know, hate. If they want to come to Christ, the book is open. It's here. God is wanting that none, none, none should perish. He wants all to come to him. But it's your choice if you believe it or you don't believe it. I can't force you to believe it. And if I did, it would be bunk. It wouldn't mean anything whatsoever. So I'm saying to you today that women are very, very, very much loved, needed and respected in the church. And if you're in a church that doesn't offer you all those things when you're in the wrong church, you should be in a church where you're much loved, much respected and much cared for. And if you're, if you're not a Christian today and you're a woman and you're listening to this, I urge you, take the time to study this. Take the time. Don't just listen to what other people say about women in the church or the Bible. Don't, don't listen to that. Take time to read this and study it for yourself and you'll find that this is a God of love. This is a God who, who wants you to trust Him. Okay? And there are so many, so many opportunities for women um, within the churches, within the Christian organisations, to be part of it and have a voice. There's no reason for any woman not to have a voice within Christianity. And I pray they would. I pray more women would do it. And there's actually more of you doing it now than there is in men, according to statistics. So praise the Lord for that. Thank you for listening today. Lord bless. Bye for now.